Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this webinar. What we're going to be talking about today is about the next version of Java, JDK 17, and how you can prepare for the next long-term support version of Java. Because as things have changed, you know, we now have a new long-term support version each three years. And so JDK 17 is the next one after JDK 11. This webinar is being held jointly by Azul and Payara. Um, my name is Simon Ritter. I'm the Deputy CTO at Azul Systems. And I'm joined today by Rudy Dabusha from Payara, who I hope will, will join us. Um, I'm not sure he's actually online at the moment. Uh, he may be having a couple of technical issues, but hopefully he will be able to join us um, before his part of the presentation. So, the way this is going to work is that I will I will talk for the first part and then I'll hand over to Rudy to talk about how JDK 17 works with Pyara. And what I want to talk about in this section is really to give you an overview of many of the new features which we've had since JDK 11 being the last long term support release. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus purely on the language features because this part is scheduled for about 20 minutes. And if I wanted to go into things like the APIs and the changes to the virtual machine and so on, uh, it would take longer than that. Rudy, during his part, will talk about some of the other things around garbage collection and uh, some of the other aspects that have changed. So I'm just going to focus on the language side of things. A couple of things in terms of housekeeping before we get started. First is that if you do have questions, then please feel free to type those into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar software. Um, we may be able to get to those as we go along, but most likely what we'll do is we'll wait until the end of the session and then we'll, we'll focus on those and we'll address any questions that people have. For this particular webinar, we are recording this and we will send a copy of the slides plus a link to the recording of the webinar to everybody who registered. That way, if you do want to share this information with your colleagues or your friends or even your family, then you can do so very happily. Right, let's get started. So the logical thing to do is to talk about the first release after JDK 11, which was JDK 12. And what we've seen is that with the six month release cycle, we are now having more features added to the platform more quickly than we've ever seen before. In terms of JDK 12, what we see here is a change to the way that switch works. Now in the past, what we've had is the switch statement. Switch statement is something that we can execute, but it doesn't return a result. And therefore we can't assign that result to a value variable because it doesn't return something. And the way that we tend to use the switch statement follows this kind of pattern, which is that we've got one variable that we want to switch on the day of the week, and we want to assign a value to another variable based on that. It's sort of like a multiple if then else type of approach, but a slightly more succinct way of doing it. As we can see from this simple piece of code here, what I've got is a variable called number of letters. I'm switching on day of the week, and then case Monday, Friday, Sunday, I assign the number of letters to be six for Tuesday at seven and so on. This is all very good and it works because it does what we need it to do. It's based on the C programming syntax. But it has a couple of drawbacks. The first is it's quite verbose. We've got lots of lines of code involved there. And there are a couple of places here where we've got the potential to introduce errors, which could be quite difficult to find. First of those is that for each of the case blocks, we need to remember to put a break statement. If we don't put the break statement, and believe me, I've done that in the past, then we automatically drop through to the next one, which is the way that things work. That could be complicated because it might introduce behavior that we don't expect. And when we're trying to debug it, we might think, oh, that doesn't really work and what was going on. So it's difficult to find that bug. The second thing is particularly in this case, because we're assigning a value to number of letters, we need to make sure that for each of those case blocks, we assign a value. If we forget to do that, then we get some inconsistent behavior. Again, it's hard to debug. So these are the drawbacks of the switch statement. In JDK 12, we now have 
the switch statement extended so that it becomes a switch expression. Now, first thing I need to note about this is this is actually what's called a preview feature. A preview feature is something that's been introduced since we switched to the six month release cadence for the JDK. What it allows us to do in terms of developing the platform is say, here's a fully formed feature. This is not like beta features where we're still going through the development phase. This is a fully formed feature, but we want to get some feedback before we make it a permanent part of the platform. And that way, if people, developers do have things that they think, well, that could be a little bit better if we did it this way, at least the developers have a chance to read that feedback, think about it, and then maybe act upon it. And we'll see how that works a little bit later on. So what we now have is a switch expression. A switch expression allows us to take a return value from the switch and assign it to a value. In this case, our number of letters. This eliminates one of the problems that we had before because now we only make one assignment. The assignment is the return of the switch statement, switch expression, and therefore we make that to the number of letters. What we can also see is that the amount of code that we've got has shrunk dramatically. Now we can use a comma separated list and we can say case Monday, comma Friday, comma Sunday, put it all on one line, which is much simpler, doesn't lose any of the readability. So we still see what's going on. And then we borrowed some of the syntax from the Lambda expression and we use the arrow operator and say that the right hand side of the operator is the value that's going to be returned from the expression case of Monday, Friday, Sunday at six, Tuesday at seven, and so on. And if need be, in the case of the default, we can also throw an exception because something's happened that we didn't expect. We can see here, we've got nice, simple syntax. It's much more concise, still very readable. So this is a really good feature in my opinion. What we can do is we can also combine the old style switch syntax with the new switch expression. So things are a little bit different here. What we're doing again is it's an expression. So we assign number of letters once. Now we've still got our case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday, but rather than using the arrow operator for each of those blocks, we say that in order to return the value, we will use break as the keyword followed by the value that's going to be returned from the expression. Now this will work in terms of the compiler because we can use break for a label which will allow us to break out of a loop. But because a label can't start with a number, we can distinguish between break with value and break to a label. But I'll come back to that a little bit later on when we talk about maybe how we can improve that. JDK 13, very logically the next release, what do we get there? Well, it's a fairly small feature, but it's the idea of text blocks. Again, this is a preview feature, meaning there's potential still to change it before we make it part of the final standard. In this case, what we see is that right from the very beginning, Java has had the ability to, to define string literals. And we can see how we can do that with a single set of double quotes, and we can define a string. The problem has been that it's difficult to make those strings include new lines. Here we've got a very obvious example where we've got some HTML tags and we want those to be organized with new lines between them. In the past, we would have had to use concatenation or we would have had to use escape characters and things like that. In JDK 13, what we've done is borrow some of the syntax from Python. And now we can say, okay, string web page, but rather than using a single double quote, we'll use three double quotes to indicate this is a text block everything after those three double quotes up to the next three double quotes is treated as part of that string. Escape characters, special characters, new lines, anything just puts gets put into that string literal. And this is very useful. And one of the things that we need to look at is what's the result of printing this out? Because it may not be exactly what you immediately expect. Because if we print it out, we'll see that the tags are actually justified on the left margin. But if you look at the text above where we've got our code, the HTML tags are obviously positioned further over to the right because we want it that way to make our code more readable. The reason we can do this is because text blocks involve the idea of incidental white space. Everything that lines up with that 
three double quotes is treated as incidental white space. It's part of the formatting of the source code and will be stripped out by the compiler. That way we can have our HTML open and close tags nicely aligned with the left hand margin, but still have the indentation that we want for those tags. So we're not simply stripping out all white space at the beginning of the text, we're stripping out everything which would be this white space that's used in terms of the source code formatting. Now, what we can do is if we want to have our code indented by a certain amount, so we do actually want some white space on the left hand side, then we can put our three double quotes on the, the next line, move them across to the left. And in this case, what we'll end up with is some intentional indentation, four characters, and then the remaining will be treated as incidental white space. If we then print out the results of that, we see that our HTML tags are in fact moved over to the right. So we've got that four spaces that we wanted, but a little bit of a drawback here, we actually get an additional blank line that we might not have wanted. But again, I'll come back to how we can solve that problem in a moment. Switch expressions. Hang on, I talked about switch expressions with JDK 11. What's changed here? Well, this is a very good example of where feedback from developers has been incorporated into a change in the preview feature before it becomes final. People said, you're right, break does work in terms of the compiler because a label can't start with a number. So we can do break six and that's the return value versus break label and it will break to outside a loop. But they said, that's a bit confusing. Let's not do that. And so the developers looked at that and said, you're right, let's make it clearer. Rather than using break, we will use yield. So now they've made a change to the way that switch expression works before it becomes final. So it doesn't affect backwards compatibility and so on. And it just makes that feature a little bit more valuable and easier to use. JDK 14. Now, JDK 14 introduced a couple of features which I think are, are really good and really powerful for the language. And I know that Rudy's going to talk about these a little bit later on. In Java, obviously, we have the idea of data that we manipulate. And often, because it's an object-oriented language, we want to encapsulate the data in a class. What we find is that for simple data classes, this involves a lot of boilerplate code, a lot of extra things that we have to do just to create a simple data class. Good example here is the point class. It's a tuple. Now, unfortunately, Java's language, it does have a tuple class, but it's kind of buried way down in some of the classes that you wouldn't expect it to be. It's not in like java.util.tuple. In this case, then we create a new class called point, and we have to specify that it has two instance variables. They're double X, double Y. We need a constructor, which takes two variables, X and Y. All we do in the constructor is assign the values of the parameters that we pass in, to our instance variables, and then we need to access the methods for our value x and y. 14 lines of code just for a tuple. In JDK 14, we introduced the idea of records. Again, preview feature, so still some time to make some changes. This simplifies the idea of that data class massively. Rather than having 14 lines of code, we now have one. What we do is we simply define our point as being a record. So we say record point, and then in the same way that we would have our constructor, we use the brackets to specify what are the values that we want to store in point. In this case, it's two doubles, X and Y. Then we have an empty set of braces because a record is effectively a special form of class. In the same way that enumeration is a special form of class, record is also one. Now records all inherit from the record class, meaning that you can't have a record which extends another class. We have single inheritance in Java, but you can implement other interfaces if you want. Now we can make that a little bit more sophisticated if we want to, because we may have situations where we've got a record and because of the way the constructor works, we want to add some additional logic. Here, what we can do is use the compact constructor. So we define our record, range with two values, int high and int low. And then within the braces, we now add a compact constructor. The compact constructor doesn't need 
the normal parameters because we've already specified those as part of the definition of the record. But then we can have some additional logic to say if low is greater than high, which doesn't make sense in case in the case of our range, what we'll do is throw an illegal argument exception. So we can add the logic we need in that case. There's various other things that apply to records, but I, I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all of that at the moment. Um, again, Rudy will talk a little bit more about records later on. Instance of is something that we've had right from the very beginning of the Java language. And the reason for this is often we are passed a reference to an object where we don't know the specific type of that object. What we need to do is to test to see which type it is. And so we end up with a very simple piece of code that we use like this, where we say if obj instance of string, so if the type of obj is string, then we need to use that. And the way that we do that is we pretty much always, and I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't do this, is to immediately do an assignment to a variable of type string, in this case s, and we need to do an explicit cast of obj to string. That way we can use our reference as a string and we can call the methods like length on it and it will all work. That's obviously a little bit extra code that we don't really want to have to do every time because literally we're gonna do it whenever we do an instance of test. Immediately after that, if we want to use that reference, we're gonna to have to do an explicit cast. In JDK 14, we now have another feature, preview feature, which is pattern matching for instance of. Now, in this case, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we'll extend the way that the instance of operator works and say, if obj instance of string, but then we'll specify a variable s. And when we talk about pattern matching in this case, it's not like regular expression pattern matching. This is to do with a pattern in terms of the code. The string is the matching predicate. So what we're looking for is to say, is this a type of string? So that's our predicate. Is it string? And we're going to match against that. And then the pattern variable that we want to use with that is s, which is what we're going to assign if obj is an instance of string. So this is where we get, it's actually sort of <laughs> kind of backwards almost, because it's like a matching predicate and then a pattern variable. Within the true branch of that, because obj is an instance of string, then the scope of s is valid. So we can use s and we can call methods on it because it's a string. So we can call le length on that. In the false branch, because obj isn't of type string, then the scope of s is not valid. So we wouldn't be able to call s and use length and so on. We can get a little bit more complicated and a little bit more clever with that. And so we can use almost what's like a, a guarded pattern where we can say if obj instance of string s and s dot length is greater than zero, then do this. And we know that with the and operator, what's going to happen is that we have to evaluate the left hand side, see if obj is an instance of string. And only if that is true, would we evaluate the right hand side. So this will work quite happily because we know that when we try to evaluate s dot length, s, the scope is valid and we can call length on it and everything will work. Obviously, if we use the or statement, that wouldn't work. It would give us a compiler error because we have to evaluate both sides of the statement there. And even if s, even if obj wasn't a string, s would not be valid and we couldn't call s dot length. Text box, again, preview feature. Now in JDK 14, they made a couple of changes essentially they added two new escape sequences. First of those is to enable you to put a backslash at the end of the line so that you can indicate that you want to continue that line without adding a new line. And this solves that problem of that blank line that we saw at the end when we wanted to add some intentional indentation. So now if we put a backslash at the end of the last line, we eliminate that problem. That's a really you know nice little thing to, to solve that. And then they've also added the idea of backslash s because previously it would have stripped out white space at the end of the line. If you want to add some white space at the end of the line, then you can do that using backslash s to indicate how much space you want. 
JDK 15. Now, Java is an object-oriented language, meaning that we have inheritance in terms of classes. Single inheritance, but that works very nicely. And the problem that we have here is that we don't have any real control over who can subclass a class that we create, unless we make it final. So if we make it final, nobody can subclass it, but that's all we can do. It's kind of all or nothing. In this example here, I've got a class called shape, and then I've got three subclasses of that triangle, square, and pentagon. All works very well, except that I can't control who else can subclass shape. What JDK 15 introduces is the idea of sealed classes, yet another preview feature. And what it allows us to do is to control who can subclass a given class. Now, the way that you can think of this is that a final is the ultimate sealed class. The other thing that you need to understand about this is it also applies to interfaces. It's called sealed classes. Interfaces are actually a special form of class, so that will work fine. And then one other thing you need to be aware of is all the classes have to be in the same package or module. So there has to be relatively close visibility. How this works is by using some new keywords and modifiers. So now we say that our public class shape is modified to indicate that it's a sealed class. And we add a permit clause, which includes the classes that can subclass shape, triangle, square, and pentagon. So our existing type hierarchy will work quite nicely. However, if somebody were to come along and say, oh, I like shape, I want to make a, a subclass of that called circle, because the circle is not listed in the permits clause, the compiler will reject that and generate an error. Now, one of the other things about sealed classes is that all of the subclasses of a sealed class must explicitly state their inheritance capabilities. And there are three ways of doing that. First is that you can continue to have a sealed class as your subclass. What I'm doing here is I'm saying the triangle is still sealed and it permits further subclasses, equilateral and isosceles. The second thing we can do is to make it final. In the case of the square, we could say public final class square. Nobody else can extend from that. And then the third thing we can do is to unseal it, make it so that anybody can subclass from that class. In this case, we use the non-sealed keyword as a modifier, public non-sealed class pentagon extend shape, and then anybody can extend pentagon. JDK 16, almost up to date. Now, it wasn't really very much in JDK 16 from the point of view of language features, no, nothing new. What did happen though was pattern matching of instance of did get to be made final, but with a couple of minor changes. The first, was that the pattern variables are no longer explicitly final. I think that's a very good idea because um, it meant that in the past with JDK 14, you couldn't actually change the value of like S in our example. Now you can. And then the other thing that they said was it's now a compile time error to compare an expression of S type S against a pattern of type T where S is a subtype of T. You need to read that a couple of times to figure out what it means. But if I show you an example, it's a little easier to understand. So I've got a method here called print upper left colored point, which takes a rectangle. And then I do if our, our instance of rectangle, assign it to the value of the variable rect. That won't compile because the compiler will say, well, you're passing in a rectangle. So if you do instance of, if, if R is an instance of rectangle, well, of course it's going to be a rectangle because you know, you're passing in a rectangle, in which case it's a pointless test and it will reject it. Last thing to say, JDK 17, the most recent, well, will be the most recent release um, when we get to the LTS. This introduced another pattern matching thing, specifically here for switch, again, preview feature. And what we're doing now is we're extending that pattern matching idea to switch statements and switch expressions. And one important thing to know about this is it doesn't change the way the existing functionality works and the important thing about that is that the default case doesn't match against null so unfortunately i don't have enough time to go into all the details of that but it's just something worth noting so in the case here what we're saying is that rather than a switch statement or expression only be able to switch on integral values strings or enumerations we can extend that to types now 
and we can say switch on O as an object that's being passed in and then do case integer I and then we can format based on I. I should actually add a, a comma I in the, the percent D there and string S obviously we would also be able to put string S there so we can switch on the, the type and then have a variable that we can assign to that and then also with the default we can just do o dot two string we can take that one step further and we can do a guarded pattern which is kind of what i mentioned earlier where we can say well okay let's make our cases more specific in this case we'll pass in an object o and we'll say case string s meaning that it has to be a string but we'll also add a test to see if the length of that string is greater than four and then do something if that isn't the case, let's say it's a string which only is two characters long, then we can drop through to the next case and say case string s, well, yes, it is a string, don't have to worry about the length, do something else. And that allows you to have a lot more flexibility in terms of how that works. Just to summarize then, um, basically the six month release cycle that we're seeing, is, I think is working really well. We're seeing lots of new language features coming through. I've only talked about those. There's also new APIs. There's new things that affect the JVM. Lots of things added since JDK 11. And if you're interested in trying these out, if you're interested in using the JDK, then check out Azul's Zulu builds of OpenJDK. They are fully TCK tested. We go all the way back to JDK 7. We support 8, 11, 13, 15, 16, and we have early access of 17. There's a free version, and there's also a commercially supported version through Azul Platform Core. And if you're interested in that, have a look at zool.com slash downloads. Okay, so hopefully Rudy is now online and I'm going to hand over to Rudy. Uh, yes, I see Rudy on the, the people there. And yes, great. Over to you, Rudy. Yes, thank you, Simon. Yeah, I had a few network issues, but everything is fine now. So hopefully it's stable enough to continue the second half of this um, of this webinar where we go into a few details um, around those um, features that uh, Simon showed with the demo but I'll also highlight a few um, new things uh, which you can find in the JDK which are not directly related to the Java language itself but more around the operational things and the um, security aspects. So short agenda, so there is a demo um, and I will show you the switch expression, text blocks and records uh, um, in combination with a classic uh, Jakarta EE web application. And, and you, we will see how easy it is to switch from JDK 11 to 17. So um, that's, that's one good thing. And as mentioned, uh, a few other things like garbage collectors, um, event streaming with the flight recorder, um, briefly the dynamic archive of the class data sharing, and then a few security related changes. But first, um, I'd like to bring up a poll to see what, uh, uh, see when and uh, why people switch from one JDK version to another version. Um, it might be that you switch uh, with every new version uh, because there is a new JDK version and you immediately use it a month later because you want to use it, some features or whatever functionality which is available. Or you maybe are using only LTS versions and then one of the um, reasons can be that you um, are missing some runtime support uh, so that you cannot switch or maybe you only use LTS because you rarely switch and switching every few years like switching from 11 to 17 is then a good enough solution or at the end you could have no um, strategy at all and you do whatever you need to switch from one version or another that can be one of those intermediate versions or LTS uh, whatever um, is required for you. So the results are in. It's a bit different as, uh, as, this, uh, as this morning. Um, now we have the majority saying that they only switch to LTS versions um, because they rarely switch. And um, the, or the second most popular one is that there is no real strategy and that um, 
they switch whenever they need something to whatever version. So that's an interesting thing to know also for us uh, because Payara uh, Micro and Payara Server also supports only supports the LTS versions because we think that um, uh, enterprise software is um, is the, has the the stability uh, in, as a main factor and that uh, those six months uh, releases is maybe a bit too short to switch every six months to a new version. But let's see how we can use those JDK 17 um, features. Um, in uh, in uh, it will be September, some, somewhere mid September, when they um, have that new um, version there. And I have an issue for switching my screen now. It's not a good day for, for me today. So, I have listed a few um, other options, a few features that uh, are interesting from the Java Enterprise perspective. Um, and the, the first one you um, rec recognize, they are all pretty discussed. But for me, um, hidden clauses can also be an interesting one. Because uh, when you create your own little frameworks uh, within your company, then uh, it might be a good thing to hide a few things. Um, and one thing that you need to be aware of that some JDK internals are now um, more uh, encapsulated, so more shielded uh, by default, so you can uh, run into that uh, issue. Um, and then something useful that I, at least I find it useful, is that you have the uh, capability of accessing by default those Unix domain channel sockets, which is uh, used, for instance, by the Docker client. And maybe one of the things that I realized uh, later on, which was missing here, is the um, the null pointer exception, where you get more information of uh, of what what went wrong at what place, or more um, more info around that uh, null pointer exception. But as mentioned, there are also other um, very um, important changes uh, between JDK 11 and 17. Uh, one is around garbage collection and performance. Uh, I have a comparison for that uh, in a moment. Um, that the dynamic CDS archive, uh, if you have watched the previous webinar in January, I showed you the um, class data sharing feature where you can um, speed up your startup of your app application. There is also no option for the flight recorder. We have that support for that new architecture. And that uh, packaging tool can also be very interesting if you are um, creating and distributing client um, resources to your customers, for instance. One question probably a lot of people have um, since the switch from JDK 8 to 11 was not always easy to that uh, to do that modular changes at the JPMS um, changes. The good thing is now that the switch is um, rather easy this time. Um, for instance, also for the runtimes, uh, the main changes that uh, we needed to do um, on the so on our on the runtimes on the server side is that we need to update the ASM library, which uh, recognize all the bytecode, because we do a lot of bytecode inspection and manipulation uh, within Java EE. But for your application, um, I guess most of the time it is just changing the compiler tar target and um, update the Maven WAR plugin. So let us have a look at the demo and see how we can use the, some of those features um, that we have shown you today and explained to you. So as mentioned, I have here a regular Maven application. I have specified the target for the compiler to JDK 17. And the only thing that I also needed to change was that um, I had to update the version of the Maven WAR plugin because as I mentioned, there was a stricter um, access to those JDK internals, uh, which means if you don't use one of these latest versions, you get an um, error that 
some field is uh, is accessed which uh, is no longer available by default. But other than that, although uh, Jakarta EE8 is um, officially only running on um, Java 8, uh, it works fine on JDK 17, as you will see in a moment. So maybe first, uh, before I compile bef uh, a, a endpoint uh, where we use one of, one of those. So suppose uh, that we have here an application which contains uh, countries and continents and that uh, we want to have a listing of all the countries uh, for a certain continent and typically you return then a list of uh, of, uh, of a DTO, a data transfer ob object uh, for the JSON. Yeah, you don't return the actual entities and as mentioned already that TTO class is a classic example where you can use that record functionality which is now available within Java. There is one small thing uh, because JSONB um, explicitly defines that only getters should be considered if it is converted to and from uh, JSON. That means that we have to define our properties like this, like get name, because otherwise um, if we put just here the name as we um, would expect, then our method that returns the contents of the property name is just called name and not get name, which means that it is not recognized currently um, by the JSON specification and that um, our JSON object is empty. But for the moment, we can get around by specifying the here the get name and the get continent name, for example, here, and then the JSONB's implementation perfectly works already on those records. Retrieving the data, it's not uh, it's not connected to a database for the moment because the Eclipse link uh, is not uh, adapted for JDK 17. Also for the because it does a lot of bytecode manipulation, that's not done yet. But later on, uh, now it's from from memory in this um, this example. But later on, if you just retrieve the all the countries from the database, you can then just use um, a a stream here to filter them based on that continent name and with the map we can convert them to our DTO and we can now um, use the tool list uh, that's, a, that's a new method since uh, J, JDK 16 instead of the collect uh, with the collectors tool list. The only difference that you need to be aware of this uh, shorthand is that uh, tool list returns an unmodifiable list whereas the collect here returns a regular array list, which means that um, that you can get into trouble when you are using this return value later on in your application. For instance, by adding new um, new items in that list. So let us start up uh, the demo. First, we switch to JDK 17 uh, so that uh, that you can see that everything is working with that um, early access build here of the Zulu um, version that, that I have downloaded. And um, we can do then Maven clean package to, uh, to generate our WAR file. Due to that um, new version of that Maven WAR plugin, I'm able to create my WAR file on JDK 17 with those future uh, with those features like a record. We do the same for the server. So again, we make sure that we are working on JDK 17, and then we start up Payana Micro. Um, here, where I say I start launch Payana Micro, which is an, uh, a web profile-based Jakarta EE implementation. I don't need clustering, but that also works. And I um, point to my application uh, that we have generated a moment ago. You see that there is passing one stack, stack trace, but um, that's um, because of one of those encapsulations around security, but that will be um, solved, of course, when we release the final version, which supports JDK 17 
um, probably um, in October or something. And then we can, once uh, the application is up and running, we can ask all the um, countries of uh, Europe, for instance, and then you see that we get a JSON array with, with the uh, expected values uh, with all uh, every country within Europe is now returned in this uh, result. A few more features uh, that we saw from um, JDK 17 to give you an idea. For instance, it is in, uh, the Olympic Games are um, currently running, so I found it was useful to um, show something with uh, the Olympic colors. Uh, you know that each color stands for a certain area in the world. It's not really the continent, but uh, um, they are also groups. And the idea is that we return based on that the country ID that we specify, that we return the associated uh, color for that country. And I'm using here uh, the VAR option because I want to give some best practices that uh, a lot of people learned around using VAR files, uh, VAR um, constructs here. This is clearly a string. Yeah? That's, that's the text block as we explained. And then of course it is very easy to see that this is a string. The so far result, it is clear for everyone that the result is a string value. Here we have a return method. We could define here also var because it, for the compiler it is clear what it is. But as you see, the um, the IDE uh, in TLJ is giving me um, a clue of what uh, what type this country for ID um, variable is. So although it is clear for the compiler. It is not that clear for someone who reads the code. So um, I get a hint from the IDE that probably I should not use var. Then here the switch expression. So based on string, because uh, you can already do a switch uh, on a string for some time now. And as in the example, uh, if um, the country is South or North America, then the Olympic color is red. If it's Asia, then the color is blue or yellow, depending if it's Australia or not, and, and, and the Pacific area. And Europe is, is green, for instance. And then we can just use the string format to um, return, um, uh, to create our results uh, from that endpoint just as before. So if it's a text block or not, that does not impact the, um, the type, it is just a string which is um, represented here in a specific way. If we query then that endpoint, uh, for instance, we query the, the color of a country 56, which is Belgium, where I'm living, and then you get the expected result that it is green uh, because it is in Europe. So that was a quick um, demo, so you can see that um, all those nice features that uh, you have seen uh, in the first half, you can easily use already uh, within the um, Java EE world uh, when the Java 17 is uh, released uh, in September or later when the runtime is updated. But as mentioned, there are um, there are more things um, important than just the Java language constructions. And one of them is the garbage collectors and the performance. And also there, there is some important um, changes made and important progress made. So I did a, a small test. It's, uh, it's only an indication uh, because it's not really um, done in a scientific way. Um, it was just on my machine, so it was not really isolated. But I try to keep as much as possible the conditions the same. So I'm using that um, micro binary that I used uh, for the demo, which um, in fact runs on JDK 8, 11, and 17. So the, um, the runtime is identical. I use the same application. So that's also a constant that did not change. I only assigned 256 megabyte of heaps because I have an, in that application uh, a request that makes high requests to CPU and memory. So I can put some 
stress on the JDK. And when I compare then the, um, the timings uh, between JDK 11 and JDK 17, then you see that JDK 11 has a average value of around 110 and JDK 17 has an average value around 90. So that means that in some cases, because here it's of course, it is, um, it is only under um, high CPU uh, and memory usages, which is not always uh, the case for your application, but you can get a um, quite significant uh, faster runtime of your application. And the good thing is you don't need to change anything. So it is the same application. Your JDK is just uh, performing better uh, with the JDK 7 version now. In the comparison, I only compared the, the, the G1. Um, in the meantime, we also have the um, Z garbage collector and the Shenandoah, which are specifically created for low latency and, uh, and um, parallel processing of your garbage collector. And that means that for, especially for larger heaps, that they perform very, very well um, in JDK 17. So that's also a nice uh, reason for switching from JDK 11 to 17, if you ask me. Monitoring and um, knowing what your application is doing is also a very important aspect of um, your task uh, if you are uh, bringing an application to production. And the flight recorder, uh, which I also demonstrated in the previous webinar, um, is mainly made for diagnostic purposes. Uh, you can have all the events uh, which are going on within the J JVM so that you can find out what is going on. Um, you can combine it with your custom events to see when, for instance, a request uh, comes in and then you can find based on that all that information um, maybe some reasons why it is uh, performing slow or um, that you have issues with your application. With um, I think it was JDK 14 that it was introduced uh, there is now the addition of the event streaming uh, within the flight recorder which can be used for monitoring uh, because with the classic uh, usage of flight recorder, uh, with, the, with the profiling, uh, the flight recorder collects all the events in a buffer, then writes it to a repository, which is on a temporary file location um, on disk. And then if you ask for a dump of that repository or when the JVM exits, you get the actual file that you then later on can um, process to see um, uh, what was the reason of the issue. With that event stream now, you can listen directly to that buffer. Uh, if you are um, starting up that event streaming within the JVM itself, or you can connect to that um, those, repo the, those temporary files in the repository if you are using an out of process um, application as I will show you in the demo. And then you can receive selected events and then you can react on them or you can just, if you are just doing more monitoring, you can log them and, and, and follow them up. But you can also react on events, for instance, if you see that your um, ap application uh, is using a lot of CPU and a lot of, uh, is doing a lot of garbage collections, for instance, you can decide that um, another version, another instance of your uh, microservice needs to be um, started up because um, there are issues with the performance and uh, with the load. So you don't need any external tool anymore for that. You can do that all within the JVM itself, within the flight recorder. So this is the image ad, so flight recorder, where the events are collected in that global um, buffer first, then um, dumped to disk in that repository. And then if you ex explicitly ask for a dump of that file, for instance, you get that recording. But let us see how we can use that um, flight recorder streaming event uh, new functionality to get some monitoring. So I have a other program, the same one that I used uh, in the previous um, webinar. So I start up that, uh, that work file. Um, 
with low memory so that you can see all the garbage collections and you see more of uh, them. Um, again, with JDK 17. We need a few configurations of that flight monitoring and starting it up. We can do that um, external uh, from the um, JVM itself. So first of all, we need to have the program ID of um, our Payara Micro. Uh, so we have the ID is 17. 423 and then first thing that we need to do um, is configure that repository part uh, where those temporary files are stored so that's the first thing that we do and the second thing that then uh, what we need to do is that we actually need to start flight recorder so that he starts collecting um, events He even gives me the message that if I want to have a, a file uh, for analysis that I need to um, launch that um, JCMD command with the JFR dump option, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to access it programmatically via that event streaming. And we have that option uh, that we open an events uh, stream um, based on that same repository location that we have specified in the configuration and we are listening then for instance we can listen on the cpu or we can listen listen on the number of garbage collections and then in this case just print out but as mentioned uh, we can also perform some more advanced uh, things uh, based on the information that we receive of course this needs to be started with the same JDK version uh, because they need to be compatible, they need to talk to each other, they need to have the same flight recorder um, information. And then if I um, call a, an endpoint again on that um, on that application which uses a lot of memory in CPU, you see that there are a lot of garbage collection events which are coming in and you see even the number uh, the, the number of pauses uh, that that garbage collection um, resulted in uh, so that for instance this um, this garbage collection um, resulted in 3.13 milliseconds of the stop the world of the JVM so um, that nothing is uh, performed for your application because it was doing the garbage collection that's of course with the G1 uh, if you switch to that Z garbage collector or that Shenandoah, that can be even uh, shorter, especially uh, for larger, larger heaps now, of course, because it's only 256 megabytes, those four milliseconds is uh, not an issue, but I think there are about 200 or 300 of these garbage collections. So that means that the timing and the time spent on um, garbage collection is already quite significant. There are, there is another, although smaller um, change, but also very nice one is the change for the class data sharing. So it is used to get a faster startup because it's preparing your class information. It does not need to read all the info from um, your class parts. It does not need to do the verification and all those steps. Before uh, with JDK 11, uh, the first step was that you needed to create a, a list of all the classes that um, you wanted to have in that archive file. And then in the second file, you need, in the second step, you need to create that archive file. And then again, he loads all those um, files from the class part. That was working nicely, but of course, it was not elegant, this solution. So they have now created something which is called dynamic archive where you just specify the archive classes at exit uh, where you specify that um, archive file and then when the JVM stops then that archive file is created from the information which is in memory in the JVM at that time so it doesn't need to store first the, um, the classes list and then again load them just the information which is already available in the correct format within the JVM in the JVM memory is just dumped to file. And with that uh, minus warm-up um, option that we have with Payara Micro, which um, 
which result in a stop of the instance when everything is ready, uh, which is specifically created for this kind of feature. That uh, is, of course, a nice complementation of it. So you have just one line um, to start up IR Micro, prepare everything and stop it. And at the same time, that archive file is created and you can use it um, the second time you start up the um, the PR micro instance and then you can have a startup uh, improvement performance of, of around 35% uh, by, by using that um, system. Almost running out of time but a few security related issues. Um, first of all the TLS 1.0 and 1.1 is um, disabled now by default. It was all already the case with uh, one of the latest JDK 11 updates, but we had a few customers and users um, which uh, ran into this issue because they explicitly used one of these two versions of the protocol to connect to an external system and that stopped working. So that's something that you need to be um, careful for if you up update um, to newer versions. And the same thing for those um, weak curves, curves for the elliptic curves cryptography, they are also disabled. But they are replaced with a few other cipher suites and algorithms uh, like uh, the one with a very nice and funny name I find, uh, the ChatChat20, for instance, and also the cha 3 based um, hash algorithms. There is also now TLS support based on the EDDCA signature algorithms, uh, etc. And that last point is also a very interesting one because you can have now um, a solution for the um, deserialization security issues because you can now specify some filters so that you can indicate that um, some classes um, are not expected in um, in a, a binary format and if you deserialize them that they are treated as um, as uh, unsafe which means that you don't have the issue that you deserialize some um, some malware, some faulty um, code, etc. So that was in brief uh, some things that uh, we think that is important for um, Jakarta web um, developers with JDK 17. So I'm not sure if there are already some questions. Uh, so I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, Q&A box at the moment. So if people do have questions, then uh, please feel free to, to type those in. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Rudy. That was that was very interesting. Um, so hopefully, yes, people have, have managed to get some information from this session regarding what's happening with JDK 7, uh, a lot of the new features there. Um, if people don't know, JDK 17 will be released in September. We are in ramp down phase two, meaning that all of the features are fixed now. So really there's there's only just uh, any minor bugs that they're triaging before they actually release the product. So uh, yeah, everything will happen in September. Okay, so again, I'm not seeing any questions coming up on the, oh, there we go. Uh, so not a question, but a great presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and since we are at the top of the hour, I will say thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rudy, again for presenting. And at that point, we will end the webinar. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.